weeks back talking about the prison prayers of the Apostle Paul. And, uh, we'll expand on that and, and get on into other prayers in the Scripture and prayer in general as the Scripture teaches and guides us. We feel like the disciples when they came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. That's where it's at. It's in prayer. And we certainly need the Lord to teach us to pray. Now, some people have taken that question and they've, or that request, and they've made it this Lord, teach us a prayer. And so they just recite that prayer over and over. But that wasn't the request. The request was not, Lord, teach us a prayer. It was, Lord, teach us to pray. And uh, we pray that God would teach us the importance of prayer in our Christian experience. Let's all stand to our feet and uh, let you stretch your legs a little bit. As you were sitting down for a season, no doubt, for prayer. And I want to read this prayer in Ephesians chapter number 1. And uh, with the help of the Lord, we'll conclude our thoughts on this particular prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. There's two recorded prayers of the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians. We looked at them a little bit, chapter 1, and then again in chapter 3, and then Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and 3, and then Philippians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1. You have the, what's called the four prison prayers of the Apostle Paul. He was in prison, and uh, he was praying. There's a lot to learn about that. You know, I hear people saying, well, they've taken prayer out of school. Uh, they can't take prayer out of school. Not as long as you're praying. Amen. Can't take prayer out of anywhere. You, you just, as a believer, you can pray no matter where you are. So it's your privilege to bow your head and to get in touch with the God of heaven. We have ready access into the presence of God, and that has been made available to us by the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 teaches that we have access into his presence by the blood of Christ, and we're thankful for that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 15, Paul says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all let's pray father we thank you for this time together and lord i pray that as we look in your word this evening that you would Teach us to pray. Teach us as we learn from the heart of the Apostle Paul what it is to pray in an intercessory way for our brethren. God, help us to know that we all have needs and help us in our time of need not to become selfish and self-centered, but help us to remember that while we are enduring our season of trial and affliction, our brethren also are going through times of affliction and trouble and tribulation. And so help us to be mindful of the needs of others. And I pray that as we look into this prayer of the Apostle Paul that you have chosen to record for our learning, that we would learn some things about what it is to intercede on behalf of others. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. You'll remember we talked, first of all, about the setting of the prayer, and I'm just going to give just a little bit of review before I get into the final thoughts here 
which is really the, the meat of this prayer. But we talked about the setting of the prayer, and the setting of the prayer was in verse number 15 where Paul said, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto the saints. This is what kind of propelled him to pray. He said, I heard some things about you. And he said, as I heard, and there were two things that he heard. He heard about their commitment to the Lord and their compassion to God's people. And he said, I heard about your faith in verse number 15. He said, I heard about your love. And he said, when I heard those things in verse number 16, he said, it, it caused me to give thanks. I actually said that I cease not to give thanks. And so this was not a prayer of, of, of heaviness. This was a prayer of happiness. He was, he was giving thanks for the people as he was praying. And he was just being thankful that the people did have faith and that they were expressing their love. And brethren, if there's two things that we ought to be known for as believers is our faith toward God and our love toward the brethren. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And so these are two great qualities that ought to be uh, existent in, in all of our lives. Faith toward the Lord and love toward the brethren. And Paul said, that's the setting. He said, when I heard of this, he said, it moved me to, to intercede on your behalf. Now, why did Paul do that? Paul had been there, and he had preached to them, and he had taught them, and he said, I'm praying that you will take your Christian experience to another level. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So that's the setting. Then the subject. What's the subject of his prayer? Well, look in verse number 18. Here's the subject. It begins in the latter part of verse number 17. In verse number 16, he said, I make mention of you in my prayers that, in verse 17, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, now here it is, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, they had already been saved, so they had the spirit of God. But he said, I'm praying now that God, through his Holy Spirit that indwells you as a believer, would now give you his wisdom and give you revelation and that just certainly means that he would unveil some things to you and he would give you understanding of what you have in christ and so here it is he said god's given you a lot of things if you remember we talked about it as you go back to chapter one and verse number three he talks about how we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings he said god has just poured out his blessing on you god has given you much wealth and by the way that's really what the book of Ephesians is about. Uh, the first part's about our wealth in Christ. The middle part in chapter 4 and 5 is about our walk in Christ. And then in chapter 6, that very well-known chapter is about our warfare. And that really sums up the book of Ephesians in a general way. Our wealth in Christ. There's so many Christians that are living below the standard that God has given them. See, God's given us so much. And we're not accessing the things that God has given us. And so here it is. Paul's saying, hey, I want you to understand that God has, has put some things onto your account. And it certainly is not just the forgiveness of your sin. Now, that's where it begins. That's pardon. That's where it begins. But he says, then after pardon, there's purpose. God didn't save you just to, to take you to heaven. See, if God saved us just to take us to heaven, he would have already taken us there. Now, we're going to heaven because we're saved. But while we're here, God said, I want you to live with purpose. I don't want you just to go through life with no aim, no, no meaning, no purpose in life. And so Paul said, I'm praying that you would see God's purpose. And as I said, we'll get to that in just a moment. And then there's the privilege of the Christian life. Brethren, we're a privileged people. God is our Father. Amen. I mean, think about that. All, uh, all that God has made and all that God has done, uh, He's our God. He's not just some, some God sitting on a shelf. He's not an idol God. He's the God of creation and the God of salvation. And so he said, I'm praying that God may give you something. And it's not $100. Look at verse 17. It's not a new car. It's something far more valuable than a new home or a, a more property. Or, and there's nothing wrong with material blessings. Don't misunderstand me. Abraham was one of the wealthiest men in all the Bible, materially speaking. Really, in all of life. But this is not what Paul was praying. There's certainly nothing wrong with us praying for God's blessing on our life in a material way. As an individual or collectively as a church, there's nothing wrong with that. What Paul was praying here, though, is something beside that. This is praying for something spiritual. 
something to where you can enjoy that material wealth. See, you can't really enjoy material wealth until you realize a spiritual wealth that God has given. There's so many people that, that get it mixed up. They just go all after the material. And there's nothing wrong with praying for and, and working for and, and gaining material things. But if that's all we have, we don't have anything, brethren. We don't have anything. But see, when we, we have that material possession and we have that material wealth and we have that spiritual insight with a purpose from God, it helps us to, to enjoy the things that God has given us in life and not just to, to get consumed in that, but get consumed in what really matters in life. And so here it is. He said, I'm praying that God may give you something. And it's not something you can necessarily put your, your hand on or that you can set your eye on. He said, it's something that is unseen to this world. It's unseen to the natural eye. Here it is in verse number 17. He said, I'm praying that God may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, here it is, in the knowledge of him. That as you get to know God, as you get to know Jesus Christ, that you will really realize what you have in the Lord. And I pray that for you, and I pray that you would pray that for me, and let's pray that for one another, that God would somehow help us to realize what we truly have in Christ. We're blessed, brethren. I mean, we're blessed. No wonder when the children of Israel would march toward Jerusalem for worship, they would shout the praises of God in song as David and others, Asaph, as they recorded those psalms, they were praising God because they realized what they had in the Creator God of heaven. God help me and God help you to realize that as well. Now here it is. He said, I'm praying that God would give you this. Now look at verse number 18. He said, the eyes of your understanding... What a statement. You see, this is what takes it to the spiritual realm. This is what makes this a spiritual prayer for spiritual things. He said, I'm not, I'm not praying that God would give you something that your natural eyes can look on, that you can see with your natural eye. He said, I'm praying that God would open up the eyes right in your heart. You look that word understanding up. It'll trace right back to the heart that you would understand, that you would know. Listen, when the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all of thine what? Heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. You see, that's what is being said here. We understand, we think with the mind, but with God we understand with the heart. And he said, I'm praying that God would open up the eyes of your heart that you could see some things, that you could see what God has given you, that you could take a look at your spiritual bank account and see what God has deposited into your account. So he said, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding, look at this next little phrase here, being enlightened. You know, I remember when I first got saved back in 1980, I remember a lot of men back then were preaching and, and a lot of teaching on the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, we've gotten away from this. And we're, we're, we're depending on on man's mind and, and man's intellect what we need is we need an illumination from the holy spirit of god we need god to remove the scales from our eyes and the eyes of our heart and to open up our understanding so that we can truly realize not only who we are but whose we are i'm glad i belong to the lord amen i'm glad i belong to the lord and so he said, I'm praying that God may open up the eyes of your understanding that you being enlightened. Now watch this next phrase. That you may know. This is where it begins. See, we're expecting a lot of people to do things before they know things. You'll never be able to do what God wants you to do until you know what God wants you to do. You don't begin to do things for God without knowing what God would have us to do. Now, I, I want you to watch this. And I, if you write in your Bible, I would encourage you to do this. It'll help you. And I think we did this before. He said, I'm praying in this prayer for these people. He said, I'm praying for you, brethren, that you might know. Knowledge is where it begins, but it's not where it ends. I've said it often. It really doesn't matter how much you know until you begin to do something with what you know. You see, we could know a lot, but if we're not willing to do some things with what we know, what is our knowledge doing but really condemning us? Because the Bible teaches it'd be, it'd be better not to know. 
than to know and not do. And so if you look in chapter 3 just for a moment, Paul begins to pray for them again. And here's what he prayed in chapter 3. Turn just a couple of pages over if you would. And so he began to pray for them in verse number um, 14. He said, for this cause I bow my knees. And we'll get to this uh, uh, eventually. But I want you to look at verse 18. He said, I'm, I'm praying that you may be able. So you see, he said, I'm praying that you may know in chapter 1. But he said, I'm praying that you may do in chapter 3. See, he didn't pray that you may be able to do in chapter 1. He said, I'm praying that you may know. Why? Because that's where it begins. You can't do until you know. And so we, we, I think what we do if we're not careful is we get saved or someone gets saved and we start telling them what to do. But they've got to know. They've, they've got to know what God said to do. We've got to get them in the book. Got to get them in the book so we can learn what God would have us to do. Now go back to chapter 1 and let's break this down. And I'll give you three wonderful truths from God's Word. Now as I study this out, I see what Paul does here. And it's really very clear. All right? And I want you to notice this. Now there's three great things that every person needs in life. All right? And here they are. And Paul said, this is what I'm praying for you. He said, I'm praying this for you. I'm praying, number one that you might realize your purpose in life. Now, I'm telling you, brethren, I'm seeing this more than ever. As I talk to people, I'm finding that people really have no purpose in life. They're just kind of existing. They're just kind of going through the grind, and they really haven't taken the time, and they really haven't got along with God, and they haven't got in the Word of God, and they've never really looked inside to see what is my purpose in life. It's... it's it, it, it's, it's a waste of, of days and minutes and hours and months and years just to exist and say, well, I hope I end up somewhere good one day. What a, what a tragedy. You don't have to go through life that way. The God of heaven has purposed something for your life. And so we'll see that. And then the second thing that man needs to know, that's the first thing that every person desires to know. And, and, and people call it all kinds of things, okay? People, you, you, you talk to people and, and, and they call it all kinds of things, but really what it comes down to is I would really like to know why I'm here, <laughs> what I'm doing here, right? They think they know how they got here. You know, the, 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 the continents collided or, you know, a tidal wave or a big bang or... Yeah, no, they, most folks don't even know how they got here, let alone why they're here. Right? Okay, so that's number one. All right? Purpose. Number two, worthiness. Everyone needs to know that they're worth something to someone. A very low self esteem. People, as you talk to them, if you talk to people often, as I talk to people, ah, I don't mean nothing. I'm nothing. If, if I were to die today, no one would miss me. Now, a lot of people just have pity parties. I understand that. But some people really mean this stuff, brethren. Now, listen to me. A lot of people feel this way. They feel like, I, I, I'm worthless. What am I? What is my life? What do I care? What, what do people care about me? And it's terrible that people feel that way, and I'm going to show you why. So that's number one. Number one, purpose. Number two, self-worth, self-esteem understanding that God puts you here as a, as a subject and an object of His great love. And then the third thing is right here in this prayer. He said, I'm praying, and that is ability. Ability. Did you know most people go through life as, I can't? I've never heard, I've never heard so many people. Uh, they, they, they got a, a case of the I can'ts. Now, well, I need you to do this. Well, I can't. Well, how about I can't? Well, even among Christians, I can't seems to be the, the catchphrase for, for this new generation. I can't. We spend more time talking about what we can't do than what we can do by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, I'm telling you, Paul was a man of I can. As a matter of fact, he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, you and I in our own ability, we're not going to get a lot done. But when we got saved, God gave us an ability to get some things done, and I want to share that with you. Now, here it is. Look at it. He said, I'm praying for you, and I'm praying that God will give you some things, 
And in order for you to get this, this knowledge, in order for you to, to realize what you have in Christ, he said, you're going to have to see these three things. You've got to be enlightened. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Now, he didn't say be open. Did you notice that? Look at it again, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. They've already been opened. They get open when you get saved. Amen? Except a man be born again, he cannot see. You get the kingdom of God. See, when you get saved, your spiritual eyes get open. But now that they're open, Paul said, I'm praying that God would take this to another level for you and that you would be enlightened. You would really see some things through your spiritual eyes. And here's what he said that you'd see. I'd like for you to underline three words. Verse number 18, there's two words. W-H-A-T, what? What is the hope of his calling? And then in verse 18, and what the riches of his glory? Would you underline those two words, what? And then in verse number 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Now here's what the apostle does. He said, I'm praying for you. And I'm praying that you may be enlightened to these three things in your life. Brethren, I, I just believe if we could get this, it would really, really change the way we approach our Christian experience. Let's look at it. The first thing he said is, I'm praying that you, the, the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you would be illumined by the Holy Spirit of God to what is the hope of his calling. Now, you've underlined that word what. I want you to do this. It's his calling, all right? The hope of his calling. And then look down what the riches of the glory of his inheritance. It's all about God. That's what Paul's saying. I want you to understand what God's done for you. It's his calling, the hope of his calling. It is the riches of the glory of his inheritance. And down look down at verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power. So he's saying, I want you to understand what God's done for you. All right? God's done some things for you. Number one, he's called you. He said, I want you to understand the hope of his calling. Now, what's he saying here? He said, I want you to understand your purpose in life. God's called you. Aren't you glad God called you? Amen. You say, well, preacher, I woke up one day and I decided I was going, I was going to get with God. No, you responded to God's call is what you did. You see, when, when you felt like in your heart that you needed to get right with God or whatever you felt, some, some people, I know what I felt. I felt like I need to get in church. I didn't know anything about God. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I just kind of equated church and righteousness. And I think that's a good thing. Amen. I think folks ought to be able to do that. Now, not that church will get you to heaven. It's just I had that mindset. Good, godly people go to church. And so I, I need to get to church. I didn't know how to get saved. I just knew that there was something down at the church that my grandma got that I needed. And so I said, I, I need to get to the church. Now, when the folks came uh, to, over to my home and they showed Sharon and I what needed to be done, well, then we realized we needed the head of the church, which was Jesus Christ. We needed to get saved. But we didn't know that until we were shown in the Scripture. And so he said, the hope of his calling, the hope of his calling, God calls man to salvation. I'm glad that he does. Just like God called Adam when Adam sinned and he and Eve ran in the garden and they hid themselves among the trees and God came out and he said, Adam, where art thou? And then he was searching for Adam because he wanted to reestablish that fellowship with him. And so the hope of your calling, in verse number 18, look at it there, the hope of his calling. I thank God for his calling, brethren. His calling has purpose. And I want you to take your Bible and turn with me for a moment. Romans chapter 8. Probably one of the, the, the most well-known verses in all the New Testament. And we, we, we focus a lot on the front part of it. But if we're not careful, we'll forget there's a second part to Romans 8, 28. Now here's what the apostle saying. He said, I'm praying for you. And I'm praying that you would realize something. I'm praying that you would realize what is the hope of his calling. In other words, that word hope, it doesn't mean... Uh, like, like we use it today, like a, a wish. Well, I sure hope that happens. No, it's an expectation. It's like the blessed hope. We're expecting Jesus to come. We're not doubting. We're not wishing, well, he may or he may not. Jesus is coming, amen? That's why it's called the blessed hope. It, it is a confident expectation. And so he said, I'm praying for you that you might have a confident expectation that came from his calling. Now, let me tell you some things. 
I am 100% sure I'm going to heaven because I've been called by God. I don't wake up any day of my life. I haven't woke up a day in my life for many, many years wondering, am I going to heaven? What a terrible thing it would be to, to not have that assurance in your life. See, that's part of the hope of the calling. Part of the hope of the calling is knowing there's a place reserved for us in heaven. Brethren, we're going to heaven. We can sit here tonight with all these burdens and every trials and troubles in our own lives, in our home lives, in our work lives, in our country, in our world. But one day, we're going to leave this world. And we're going to leave all these trials behind. I'm telling you, it's so. It's real. I'm not trying to... This is not a pep rally. I'm preaching the truth to you. We're going to heaven, brethren. We're going to heaven. You say, well, you know, preacher, I'm, I'm, I'm under a heavy burden right now. I'm sorry about that. And we all ex experience burdens. And I'm not minimizing that. But I'm here to tell you, one day, we're going to lay these burdens aside. And we're, we're checking out of here, brethren. We're checking out of here. And we're going to heaven to be with Jesus, praise God. Forever and ever and ever and ever world without end. Praise His holy name. It's a reality. It's a reality. And I think sometimes that we get so bogged down and what's going on that we forget about what is the hope of his calling. God has shown me down the road how this thing's going to end. God has taken me to this place to where I'm going in my spirit. And I know that the eyes of my understanding have been enlightened. And I'm going to that city where the street is gold. Amen. I'm going there. I'm headed toward that city. It's real. It's real. We're not careful. We'll sit around and say, I'm going to heaven. What? Nobody going to want to go with you? You come to me and you come to me and tell me you're going somewhere like that, like that, with that attitude. I'm gonna say, go yourself. Amen. I don't want to go with you. Sounds like to me something bad's gonna happen when you get there. Romans 8. Look at it. Verse 28. Romans 8, 28, you know it by memory, probably. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And they do. You may be going through something very bad right now. But God can take bad and turn it into good. God can take burden and turn it into blessing. Trial and turn it into triumph. Only God can do that. But God can do that. And it says here, that's just part of it. Now look at the next part. He said, God can work all things together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called, watch this now, according to His purpose. See, God saved us, and, and with that pardon, there's attached a purpose. And I'm not saying get over your pardon. Forever be shouting that you're set free. Forever praise God for your pardon. But don't forget with that pardon, th there came a purpose. God has a purpose attached to the pardon that he gave you when he, when he set you free. He didn't set you free to do as you will. He set us free to fulfill the purpose that he gave us in life. And so as we go back now to Ephesians 1, we see that first thing, purpose. Oh, I pray that you and I would know God's purpose. Sometimes we might not know every minute detail of all of God's purpose, but rather I'm here to tell you, you can know God's purpose. And this walk that we walk is a, a walk of faith. It's one step at a time, isn't it? Just one step by faith at a time. And with each step, God will reveal what is meant in that step, and he will direct into the next step. If we would just be sensitive to the leading of his Holy Spirit. We have, we have allowed the, the noise of this world to block out that still small voice of the Spirit of God to where our minds are so clouded and our hearts are so full of everything but that, that that other than what should be. We don't hear what God is saying. I want to encourage you. Be still. Every day, just find the time to be still and know that God is God and hear Him. And hear Him, all right? So, number one, the purpose. The purpose, which is the hope of His calling. All right? You're back to Ephesians chapter 1. Look over and just for a moment now, just for a moment into chapter 2. Just by comparison, Ephesians chapter 2. Notice what it says in Ephesians 2. Look at verse 12. In Ephesians 2, that at that time you were without Christ, 
being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. Having no hope without God in the world. I'm so thankful that that's not my lot anymore. I'm so thankful to God that that's not where I am anymore. I, I, I've been there. It breaks my heart when I look into the eyes of those in whom I speak to and I can tell that's where they are. That's their lot in life. Sometimes we get angry and, and our anger, as long as it's righteous indignation because of the, the actions of those who are without Christ, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but we have to be cautious because we have to remember in our, in our righteous indignation, here, here these people are, they have no hope and they're without God in the world. What a terrible plight in life. And yet it's so. But you and I have this hope. As we go back to chapter 1, Paul said, I'm praying that you might realize what that hope of his calling, what all it entails. Could I, could I just encourage you to begin to look into that? There's so much in that, brethren, I'm telling you. There's a lot locked into that now. The hope of his calling. You say, well, I'm, I'm going to click my heels and I'm going to heaven. Well, praise God, you are going to heaven if you're saved and you ought to be excited about it. But can I tell you that the destination is just part of the calling? There's a journey. There's a journey. And in that journey, there's purpose. You see, the destination is, is the way the journey is going to end. We're going to heaven. But the journey in and of itself God will give purpose to where there will be fulfillment. You can enjoy heaven on your way to heaven. And there's a lot of folks living like hell. I mean, living like hell on their way to heaven. You say, preacher, that's an oxymoron. It is. But you know them and I know them. It can happen. It can happen. And if the devil had his way about it, there's not a one of us in here that wouldn't be living like hell on our way to heaven. You say, well, now, preacher, if you're saved, you ought to live a certain way. Well, I, uh, you're not going to get any argument out of me on that. But what you ought to do and what you do is two different things. Right? Now, well, if you're saved, one saved, they ought to live for God. Well, I believe that with all my heart. I know this. I know that if a man's in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. I do know that. There ain't no ought to about it. He is. But now, some things that we ought to do doesn't always get done. And so if the devil can get in... And I mean really mess this journey up if you're not careful. It's not going to change your destination. It may get you there sooner. But it's not going to change the destination. So be careful about the hope of his calling. Look into it. Look at what God's given you. Could I encourage you to do that? Look into it. Be thankful for the pardon. And on the other end, be grateful that there's going to become the privilege of you one day being around the throne of God in heaven. Brethren, we're going to be there one day. We're going to be around the throne of Almighty God in heaven. That is something, that, that's exciting. It's real. But now between that pardon and that privilege, there's a purpose for this journey that we're on. And I just pray that God would help you and I to really, really know what that purpose is as we complete this journey. Now, number two, not only is there their purpose, and I'm not going to spend as much time on these next two. I'm just going to give them to you. And if God leads me to, we'll open up on them in time to come. But if not, I pray you'll look into them. I want you to think about this, pleasure. All right? We live in a pleasure-crazed world. But this is a different kind of pleasure. This is God's pleasure. I'm just going to give you a quick truth here that I hope will help you. I want you to look in verse number 18. The latter part of that says, and what, and there it is. Here's the second thing. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Now, this is not talking about our inheritance. See, we're going to heaven. And part of our inheritance is we have inherited eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have inherited a mansion over yonder. Amen. We've inherited that city, that city of God. See, our inheritance is mentioned. Look at chapter 1, verse 14 which is the earnest of, and I want you to underline that next word, our inheritance. Now, the word earnest, and, and that's a good accountant term. We heard that term when we were talking about our funding of our, uh, our loan for our property that we purchased. An earnest, it's like a down payment. It's a security, it's like a, uh, a security bond. 
to, okay, we're going to put down this to ensure that the rest of this comes. And here's what he said. He said in verse 14 of chapter 1, what is the earnest of our inheritance? That's what the Holy Ghost is. So that's our inheritance. You follow me now? We have an inheritance. You know what God's left you? Do you? You do realize you've been adopted. You've been put in God's will. Read the book of Hebrews. God said, I put you in my will. See, there's a lot of folks been, been, been made uh, benefactors, beneficiaries in God's will. Don't even know what God's left them. I'm telling you, we need to understand what we have in Christ. Remember what we said about Ephesians? Wealth. God's left us something. Right? God's left us something. He's given us something. And so we said here in verse number 14, it's our inheritance. But when you go to verse number 18, he's not talking about our, our inheritance. He's talking about God's inheritance. Look at what he said again now in verse number 18. He said, I'm praying God would enlighten your minds that you are part of God's inheritance. He said in verse number 18, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? In other words, we are part of God's inheritance. Amen? See, when God created, he spoke. But when God redeemed, he suffered. I'm part of that. Amen? I'm part of that. I'm part of God's inheritance. Isn't that something? In other words, God's, God's going to show us off as his trophies of grace one day in eternity. That's what the scripture teaches. We are trophies of what God's grace can do. Look at what God's grace can do. Amen. See, we're part of God's inheritance. God's inherited us. You do realize that. That's what the Scripture said. The inheritance in His saints. That's exactly what He said. And then finally, and so that, that's the pleasure. So in other words, God takes pleasure in us. A lot of folks don't view God that way. A lot of folks, the devil has gotten involved in their minds and their lives, and they think God is angry at them all the time. When they think of God, they, they almost cringe. They almost think, you know, God, God is angry at me. God doesn't like me, let alone love me. God wants to punish me. What a, what a terrible way it would be to live life that way. Now, I understand when, when we sin and, and, and we are not willing to repent of our sin, there is condemnation hanging over us. I understand that. And that does make us feel that way. But that ought not to be the way we live our lives is under condemnation. There's no more condemnation to you and I who are in Christ Jesus, brethren. We've been removed out from under that condemnation. And the only way we're going to get back under that is for us to place ourselves under that judgment of unconfessed sin. If we don't get, I'll just mention this one. The next one in verse number, I gotta, I'll got have to show you something before we close here, okay? Verse number 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? There's four words in this, in this section here that talk about the power of God. His power, working, mighty, power god said i want you to know i've given you some ability and you can't do this on your own you're not going to be able to carry out this journey on your own you say well I'm, I'm i'm glad that god dug me out of the pit set my feet upon a solid rock i'm gonna take off and go my way god said oh no <laughs> uh -uh. you're gonna need my power to do this now why do we need god's power i need i need god's power to live my daily life See, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, brethren. The flesh is weak. You won't, get, you, you won't get out of sight and you'll already be falling. We need the power of God to walk in the spirit. All right? I'm going to close with this. So here's three things. Number one, purpose. Number two, worthiness. You've got to realize how much God loves you. And I'm going to show you this in just a moment. It's, it, it was shown to me as a great blessing to me many years ago. And then number three, ability, the power of God to get the job done. There's nothing more frustrating than wanting to do something but not having the ability to do it. You ever been there? I believe that there's people who really want to serve God with their life. I really do. But they just feel so inept because they haven't learned what it is to lock into the power that is to us. We're, look at it in verse 19, who believe. God gave us the ability, the power to carry out the journey that he's purposed us in this life. 
And there's folks thinking, well, you know, I, I've got to go to Bible college to learn how to do this. I'm not against Bible college. I went to one, all right? But that's not what God is saying here. God's saying that I've given you something far greater than a Bible college. I put the Holy Spirit of God in you. And he is able to lead and to guide you into all truth. He will unleash the power of Almighty God in your life if you'll just tap into it. All right? Turn to the Song of Solomon. This is where we'll close tonight. All right? Song of Solomon. If I were to ask you, and I'm going to ask you, on a scale of 1 to 10, I like that scale of 1 to 10 thing. How much does God love you? Now, you know God's listening. Depends on how your day went would probably determine the answer that you gave to that question. That's how fickle we are. We think God's love depends on our actions. God's love is unconditional. And it's really hard for our minds to wrap around that, isn't it? I mean, it really is. Our little finite mind, we're so used to loving people for what they do and how they act and who they are. You know, we, we, we know nothing of unconditional love. I mean nothing. But I'm glad that the God of heaven loves me with a, not only an everlasting love, but an unconditional love. Isn't that something? If we could just get a hold of that, Song of Solomon, turn if you would to chapter number 3, 2. Song of Solomon chapter 2, look at verse 16. Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 16. This was you and I one day. We got saved and here's how we felt. My beloved is mine and I am his. You see that? My beloved is mine and I am his. You say, well, that sounds good. Well, it does until you read the next in chapter 6. Look at chapter 6 in verse number 3. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. What's different? What's different? The first time, he put what he had. Jesus is mine. Right? You hear people talk. Jesus is mine. Uh, man, we're so fickle. He might be ours one day and, 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 and not the next. We, we, we're so changing. We change with every, with every wind. My beloved is mine, and I am his. But then he grows up a little bit, and he realizes, well, you know, it's not about Jesus is mine. It's I belong to Jesus. That's where the real emphasis is, amen. And oh, by the way, in verse number, look at it now, chapter number 6, verse number 3. This is really the, the, the message of the Song of Solomon. My beloved, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I know it's between the Shulmanite and Solomon. But he said, I am my beloved. In other words, it's not that he belongs to me. It's I belong to him. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. But I got Jesus. No, no, you're mistaken. He has you. He chose you. See, that's where it's at. And then finally, he understands. He finally gets it, and here it is. Don't miss it. Chapter 7, verse number 10. I am my beloved's. And that's it. He doesn't say anything else about his beloved, you know, and my beloved is mine. He just leaves that part out. He says, and I've learned that his desire is toward me. It's amazing how he grows up in this in this song. And God wants you and I to grow up that way. What's, what's God saying? He said, I want you to know how much I love you. Brethren, I think we've allowed this, this group, let's stand to our feet, I think we've allowed this group that preaches God's love without God's holiness to intimidate us a little bit to where we almost feel like, well, we don't want to get too top-heavy on God's love. You can never get too top-heavy on God's love. Never. You can never go overboard with God's love. As a matter of fact, I think we have really, really undercut God's love. 
If you could just get a hold of how much God loves you, it'll change the way not only you live your life, but it'll change the way you serve your Lord. God loves us. And he, when you realize that, you'll never have low self-esteem. People walk around all the time, well, you know, I just don't mean anything to anyone. Well, you must not have read this book. You mean everything to God. You mean everything to Him. You're a special object of His love. And if you were the only person, we say this all the time, but I, I wonder sometimes if we just say it. I really believe if I were the only person that needed to be saved, Jesus would have still came and died for my sin. God help you and God help me to realize how much He loves us. Let's bow our heads together. Paul said, I'm praying for you. And I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened to some things. And brethren, unless you and I pray, 